Oh, I'm just gonna turn my fixed up. This is pretty exciting. I finally got um, one of these decal uh, thermometers. Um, of course, the uh, box is not in the best shape. Um, but if we open it up, there it is. Um, did come with this. This is like a sticker. Um, kind of in bad shape though. Not quite sure exactly uh, where that came from. Um, anyway, take a look at this here. See, there is the uh, stamp, uh, serial number 1449. So according to the list of serial numbers, which I'll show later, I think this was made in around 1874. Um, if someone has taken the liberty to uh, scribe in numbers with little arrows so you know where to line it up to. Um, all of the knobs are here, which is good. Sometimes these go missing. Uh, of course, none of the decimal pointers are here, but it's not really surprising. And this machine is interesting because you see right here, um, which you can kind of see, says the air thermometer uh, Tate's patent improvements. Um, and what that means is uh, Tate, who later went on to make Tate's air thermometer in England, uh, made some modifications to this machine. Um, the most obvious being these handles here. Usually these are just, uh, I'm guessing, wood knobs, but they've installed cranks. Um, there are also some other modifications that we'll get into later. Um, but the first thing that I want to do is get this out of the box so that I can get the box out of here before it incurs any more damage. You can see it's uh, separating there. This is the back corner that came off, um, separating here. So I want to get this out. Um, also, you can see that there's two pieces missing, one here and one here. They're supposed to fit in these grooves. Um, I do actually have some of those. There's a little bit of paperwork here, we'll go through that later. Um, this piece is supposed to be the back for this little box that's come loose. Um, this is, I believe it's this side, so this would only be in here something like that, but it would be attached here. I also have to reattach that. And then there's this, which goes right in here. I believe that's like a support for the bottom of the carriage. Um, so anyway, and this is like I said, the back corner of the case. So this comes out with only uh, two screws. This one right here. Actually looks like that might be the only thing holding that side on. And this one right here. Um, this machine was expensive, but since I started doing this hobby, there's more things that I've regretted not buying when I had the opportunity to the things I've regretted buying. So I decided to buy this. Um, gosh, every calculator person, this is the one to have. Let's see if we can lift this up. This is not light. Off to the side. And I will put all this stuff back in the bottom of the case here. And we'll set this off to the side. I'll have to glue, um, see if I can get this to glue back together and maintain some structural integrity. Put that off to the side, and here is the mechanism itself. Um, I have, I have played with this a little bit. It seems most of like it's just gummed up. Although there is something concerning right here, which we'll get into in a minute. Not really sure. You can see, but one of the teeth is a little bit messed up there. So I'll have to see if we can do something about that. It's not missing, it's just kind of bent. So hopefully maybe we can bend it back. Um, or something. We'll have to see what we can do there. Um, but in the meantime, oops, we'll come back up here. And if I start to disassemble this, because like I said, it overall it is pretty sticky. Um, so you, I'm not sure we'll be able to see this, but if you lift this up, you can tone these. They do tone. Um, and if you turn the handle, it does reset them. 
Um, this one, however, the spring is broken, so it just kind of spins around. So I'll have to see if we can fix the detent spring on that. Um, anyway, see if we can get the carriage off here. Looks like there's one screw right here. Let's see if we can get that out. or something. So let me see if I can get that rod out and we'll go from there. Alright, so that's all. You can see the uh, carriage here. Um, just set that to the side here. Um, it was just, you know, sticky in there with dirt and dried grease and stuff. You can see the uh, rod itself is pretty dirty, so it's got a little tiny bit of rust at the one end there. Um, Anyway, that's out. So now you get a better look at the back of the machine here. So these pieces right here are part of uh, what Leighton added as his improvements. Uh, these are springs that actually provide some drag to these shafts here. Um, and we'll probably, we'll probably have to take this panel off to see, but he actually removed the um, overshoot locks when he added these. Um, why? I don't really know. Um, I don't really know what the advantage of having these instead of the mechanical overshoot locks are. Um, you know, other machines like the Freedom and, and stuff like that uh, didn't use these. They did use the mechanical um, overshoot locks. So I'm not really sure why this was an improvement, but uh, that's what he did. Um, so you see these do move, but they're really stiff. So probably there's a bunch of dried grease underneath these springs and potentially in other bearing places as well. So um, it's a lot of stiffness there. Of course, these are all, don't really wanna move. I'm guessing that, because these have a little finger that goes into a gear that slides on the shaft. So probably the, the shaft is just greasy and dirty. So the gear doesn't wanna slide. Um, and this is, pretty well stuck as well. So, see what we can take off. This unscrews. That comes right off like that. Um, this has a pin in it, but it looks like by taking off two screws here, um, you might be able to take off the whole uh, handle piece. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. I don't wanna really mess with that pin that pin's been in there for almost 150 years. Um, knowing my luck with table pins, it's probably not going to come out and I really don't want to risk messing anything up here. So just take out this little block comes off and you can see there's some dirt inside there that had to be cleaned up anyway. So that should Free that up, I can see the shaft there. So now let's see if there's only four little screws that hold this top down. Some of them are loose, so it might be somewhat concerning. These uh, pieces should come off with the top plate. right here. Oops, if you take all the screws out. So 
let's see. This will come off of here. Maybe. Seems like this is stuck here somehow, so might end up having to take out these two screws that hold the hold the back of the going block in if I can. This is going to show up on camera, looks like it will. Let's see if this whole thing will come to come out again. Oh, I see the issue. This must want to have to come out too. There we go. So we'll just set this off to the side with all of its. As you can see here, uh, those are, these are those pins I was talking about. These fingers here. Set this down. Those fingers there go into these here, and then slide these. And you can see. So you don't want to slide much at all. Uh, just because of the dried grease and dirt on those shafts. And here you can see where the uh, overshoot mechanism was removed. Um, so on the back of these gears here, there should be, and they call it like a Maltese cross or something. Basically it's a disc that has little kind of like semicircles cut out of it. And those semicircles mesh with these um, outer semicircles here. And the idea is that um, as soon as you get past the uh, tooth section of the drums, what is this? Just notice that funny looking thing down there. Have to check that out. Uh, anyway, the idea is as soon as you get past the tooth section of the drums, this semicircle will mesh into the semicircle in the uh, disc here and prevent this shaft from turning any further. Um, and that is just in case, you know, you give the handle a good swift crank and these gain some momentum and want to keep going even after they, after they stop being driven by the teeth, which you can see um, some of the teeth right here on the Leibniz wheels. Um, so if you give this a good swift crank and these want to keep moving after they stop meshing with the teeth, uh, this meshing in there uh, blocks them from going any further than they should. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not really sure why Leighton thought that removing these and adding these drag springs was a better idea. Um, but anyway, that's what we have. Uh, if you go look at uh, Leighton's arithmometer, um, it has the same setup. It has these uh, drag springs. But, so um, I'm going to go through here. Actually, you can see these are the uh, carry trips. So whenever a carry happens, this will push this down. And you can see kind of what that does. There's going to be a little finger. Actually, you can kind of, here you can see the finger, here you can see it. So this finger, when the carry trip happens, see how that engages? With that, with the gear in the next column. So when this rotates down, it'll advance that one position. Um, so anyway, not really a super complex mechanism. Uh, it's really pretty basic. You know, this was the first uh, calculator that you could actually go out and buy. Um, first on the market in 1851, uh, made up to at least 1912. Um, of course, they had various improvements along the way. But anyway, so actually, I think I see why this was not working. Looks like the machine, so it must be that messed up tooth on this gear here allowed it to get out of time. So when the crank handle's in the home position, um, the rest of the machine is not where it should be. 
So this is going to be really hard to tone like this. So I'm going to do, I'm going to go through and start cleaning and see if I can get the mechanism loosened up and uh, then we'll go from there, see if we can rotate this back so that this inner lock is not uh, locked out. You can see there's a cutout in this disc here and it's rotated so that the cutout is on a line with this finger so that's why you can't uh, change modes. So this will have to rotate one way or the other but it's, it's too stiff to do by hand now so uh, I'm going to go go through and start cleaning stuff up and see if I can get that freed up. Um, actually you can kind of see what's stiff and what's not so see how this shaft is nice and free. This is nice and free. This one feels pretty sticky. So I have to put some uh, lubrication on that. This one doesn't want to... Right, oh, there it goes. That one's pretty free. That one's pretty free. So this one seems to be the problem, child. So uh, like I said, I'll start cleaning up um, and see if we can get this freed up. And then we'll see uh, where we go from there. Oh, I think I found the issue. So that uh, funny looking piece that distracted me earlier down here actually was the problem. Turns out it's the nib of somebody's fountain pen. Uh, of course it got all bent up. These should be, I'm not sure if I can get them back, but these should be, you know, spread out like your regular uh, fountain pen nub or nib or whatever you want to call it. Um, so that had gotten I guess they dropped it through one of the slots and it somehow got sucked into the bevel gears uh, in between these two columns here, but uh, with that out of there, now this moves nice and free. So right there is where we should be. See now how this finger is lined up? See if this will... Yep. That actually works pretty pretty good. It's a bit sticky, so we'll have to uh, clean it up somewhat. But all right, so that's uh, good news. Um, so that's probably what messed up the teeth here. Then somebody got that that nub jammed down in there, and then tried to uh, go force past it with the crank. Um, I would mess these up. So hopefully we can uh, recover. Just get down on on that and just have a look at bad it is. So right here you can see those two teeth are kind of messed up. That one might also be messed up. Of course now we're starting to drive so let me try to drive something. Yeah, let me move, let me reset all these uh, sliders to zero so we don't try and add anything. We're not ready for that yet. So we can go around now. Now we are hitting on the counter increment. There. And now we are back to where we started. So, so we got one real bad one there and one possible one there. Just some brass shavings I don't have to clean up. So hopefully we can recover from that. Uh, so far, this is the only issue, really, that I see here. Um, that clicking is just the uh, counter increment. Um, looking at the uh, Leibniz drums, I don't really see any issues. Those you can see here. Looks like we'll be okay. So hopefully, uh, of course, we don't really know until we get this all back together and test it out, but. So that's uh, definitely definitely glad to have found the issue. Um, I'm still, of course, still going to go through and clean up as best that I can and oil everything. Um, but you know, weird death by fountain pen. Um, yeah, that's all I all, really all I got to say for now. Um, just uh, on the cleaning, you can see here's the uh, counter increment. Um, so in this column, the finger that would have driven the uh, carry, if there had been a column before this, is what drives the counter increment via this little thing here. So, you can see that just 
think I'm going to buy one for every rotation. Increments. Um, it's like it increments. Actually, actually, what increments? It must be there. Must, yeah, see this wide tooth gap here must slot up into there and grab that little nub. As you can see, is the uh, edge of the counter wheel. Alright, so I feel a lot better now that this is already so smooth even before I've done any cleaning. So, yeah, on to the cleaning. Uh, so I've been working on um, cleaning and oiling um, some stuff here. Um, so all these are I'm trying to grab this one. This is the carry, but this is the bottom. All these are oiled up, cleaned up, slide nice and smooth. Um, I did take off all of the uh, drag springs or whatever you want to call them. Um, I cleaned this one up and installed it. And I adjusted it so that there's just enough drag to kind of hold this in place. Um, the idea being that, let's move this up here. Uh, the idea being that I won't overshoot. So if I uh, rotate this here. So it's nice and it's loose enough that the machine can drive it. Um, but it's not so loose that it, you know, overshoots because if it overshoot, if it had overshot, then when this came around the next time, it wouldn't mesh properly with this uh, gear here. Um, and you can see that it does. So for example, if I, if I start this and then go backwards, now it's going to be not lined up properly. So if I come back again, see it, it jams there. So if, if this had not stopped at exactly the right point, this is what would happen the next time you come around. So if I just manipulate this slightly, you can see that's not what happens. It always stops at exactly the right time to uh, mesh with that next time around. So I'm gonna repeat that process on all the other ones, get all those adjusted so that um, the machine is smoothly, runs smoothly. Um, also, I took off the part of the carry trips, so that's this piece here. It right, normally sits right about in there. I uh, took that off and took off all these little fingers that well, I don't need to clean that up. Um, and with that out, you can kind of see the uh, motion for that. So normally these fingers would be like right here, and then when the pushes on when the carry trip pushes on the finger, then this pushes on this which is not tied right to happen right now. There we go. So they'll only engage at a certain point because there's a cam on the shaft here that clears the carry trip. So if you try to engage it when the clearing section is uh, in line with it, it's not going to engage. Um, so I just rotated that to get it out of the way. So now you can see kind of how that works. So basically all that this is is, so there's a pivot there and then when you push on this end, it pulls out the shaft on the bottom. You can see it popping out the back there. And that is attached to a little fork on this piece that slides back and forth on the shaft. And that piece, if we rotate this around, you see it has a little finger on it. And as you can see, it's rotating the, um, the one next to it like that. So then when this is disengaged, that moves the finger out of the way of that gear, so now it doesn't move it uh, when you rotate this around. So that's basically how the carriage work. There's a little nub on the uh, bottom, you can see right there, that little nub there uh, on the bottom of each accumulator digit. Uh, when it passes past a uh, nine or backwards past zero, it will push this in to engage that uh, carriage trip, which will then drive the next position uh, one place, uh, either forwards or backwards, depending on whether you're adding or subtracting, because 
even though this shaft always rotates the same direction, depending on whether the top or the bottom gear is engaged with the um, accumulator digit uh, determines which direction the digit will rotate, either forwards or backwards. Um, so pretty simple, that's basically how that works. Um, and of course the same, same sort of thing in each column. Like I said, this one won't engage because the uh, clearing thing is in the way. So you have to look at that a little bit, then it engages. There we go. And see there, they went past the clearing thing and then I cleared it. Um, so, and then in the back here, you can see those two holes there and those two little fingers, those are the springs that hold it. So um, if you set one of these, get it to the right position to set, you can see that the uh, spring just pops, the, these little fingers here, which are spring fingers, just pop over um, through the holes and then detent on the outside. Uh, so that's how they have that set up, the detent there. So yeah, um, got to finish cleaning up all these, clean up the uh, fingers that trip these, and um, yeah, I was able to get the gear to mesh somewhat better, so at least it, it should work. Um, like I said, of course, the, or like I said, well, like I should have said, the appropriate thing here to do, of course, would be to replace both this gear and the uh, corresponding gear on the bottom of the crank handle, but um, I don't have anybody do that right now. So we'll just uh, see if we can get it to go like this. Um, just to kind of clean up those teeth a little bit. And I think it'll work. Um, so I'm going to finish uh, cleaning up those last couple pieces. And I think we might be done with uh, this bottom part here. I uh, still have to clean up the uh, bottom and the top plate for the input sliders. And we still have a couple of issues to address with the carriage itself. But oh uh, yeah, so far so good. Um, I'll do some more. Almost done with this and got to do some more cleaning there, but yeah. All right, so I got um, all of these springs uh, oiled and reinstalled and adjusted. Um, just so that there's some slight drag um, on each of those. And I did the same thing where I spun the machine mode by hand, just using these gears in the front in each column, uh, except for these last two because I don't have lead this wheels, but in all the other columns, just set it to nine, spun it over, uh, made sure that it, you know, was repeatable and wasn't going to, you know, overshoot and get misaligned and jammed on the next time. Um, and I just want to point out that when I, when I was spinning this over by hand, um, that's faster than I intend to crank the machine when I'm actually running it. Um, my thought is just that, you know, if I spin it over faster than I intend to actually use the machine, um, and it's fine, then it should definitely be fine at the slower speed that I intend to actually uh, run the machine at. Um, because I got these, uh, all up and reinstalled. So at the right time. See this little finger, like triangle finger here is what will hit against that um, diamond shaped peg on the bottom of each accumulator wheel. But yeah, I think uh, this piece is pretty much done now. Um, this uh, bottom frame, everything, pretty everything's oiled up and you know, it seems to be running perfectly fine. Uh, so next I'm going to turn my attention to the top plate. Um, as you can see, these have these tracks have to be cleaned up and some of these springs have to be adjusted. You can see this one has absolutely no tension on it at all. And the idea of these is that, I kind of get stuck there, but the idea of these is that um, these will detent so that when you slide these, they'll detent into, you know, a set position. Um, but right now this one is just, you know, completely free. So that has to be addressed. Um, so I think I'll set this to the side now and move on to that. And then once that's cleaned up and we reinstall it, then we can, you know, play around with setting some numbers and making sure that, you know, everything works smoothly there. Um, you know, like these are pretty smooth now. We have to make sure that they remain smooth when driven by those fingers in the bottom of those sliders. Um, yeah, you know, this machine overall is really pretty simple. Um, you know, compared to a lot of the other machines that I've worked on, there's, you know, everything is pretty much open and spaced out. You know, there's not like a lot of dense uh, mechanism. 
and um, really not that many parts overall. Um, so yeah, just gonna jump over to that, and then once we get that done, the only thing left is the carriage. Oh, and the case too, which I have been working on. Um, so yeah, I've got the uh, side glued back on, and um, Mr. Rapid Calculator is acting as a weight uh, to hold that in place while the glue dries. So um, once that's back on, then I'll address the internal pieces of the uh, case as well. So I have the uh, machine pretty far disassembled. I've had the carriage removed and the uh, input slider plate that goes here also removed. Um, and with those out of the way, you can get a pretty good idea of the working of the mechanism here. So this shaft here is the main drive shaft. Um, the crank on the front plate is attached to a shaft that goes down here and has a bevel gear that meshes with this gear, which then drives the shaft all the way across. And then this shaft, each of these bevel gears drives a bevel gear on the inside of this, these Leibniz wheels here. So basically how this works is um, on the front plate, which would normally be right about here, you'll set one of these sliders to the number you want to enter. And what that does is on the back of those, there's little fingers you see. And those little fingers will be inside little grooves here on these wheels and will pull them to whatever position you set via the slider. So if I push this to say right about here, and then if I turn the crank, everything will rotate around. As you see, this is now meshing with the teeth on that position of the wheel. So I think that was seven, right? So by having the gear in that position, this should mesh, mesh with seven of the teeth. I think I might have a little bit high. I think it's catching the bottom of the eighth tooth. Let's tap this down just a little bit. So now, yeah, so now it's going to mesh with seven of the teeth on the Leibniz wheel. Um, and so if I wanted to do nine, then I would, when I set the finger to nine, this would be all the way up here. Now it's going to mesh with nine of the teeth on the Leibniz wheel. And of course, all the other columns are set to zero. Uh, you can see the gears all the way down there, not meshing with anything. Uh, that's the basic principle of how you select and add a number. Um, pretty simple. And then the carry, carry works by these little trips here. So when the machine is in the correct time, of course, that would be after you've added in the first column. So we'll rotate this so that, or while you're adding in the first column, I should say. So while this Leibniz wheel would be meshing with the gear in the first column, this can trip and see it stays in that position. That's the carry trip. So if this wheel had rotated um, past nine to 10, or if I was doing subtraction and had rotated backwards past zero to nine, this will, there's a little peg on the bottom of the digit wheel that will trip this. And now if I continue, notice there's this finger here that will push the next column forward one position. And if I keep going, I guess I went around too many times, but you'll see that this also reset then. There's a, a cam on the bottom of that trip. Get this back too. You can see when I push this down, this pushes on the lever, which has a cantilever or a pivot down in here, which is attached to a shift fork, which pulls this piece forward such that this peg will align with this gear. In the untripped position, this peg is pushed back so it misses the teeth of this gear and bypasses in this non tooth section. Um, and like I said, then there's a, a, a cam on the bottom of that piece, so as it keeps rotating, uh, that once it's done with its carry, that cam will ride up on a pin and push this back to the untripped position. And what it's hitting now is the uh, counter increment. So there's another finger, similar to these fingers, on this first drum, uh, because there is no carry input from this side, there's nothing over here. Instead of that finger being the carry, like it is on the rest of the drums, it's actually um, fixed to always engage, and that's the counter increment. So that finger will engage with one of the teeth here, 
and push that forward one position. And um, the top side of this engages with the counter digit in that position to turn that one position forward uh, as that per cycle, as that finger passes by on the bottom. Um, normally, these machines would have uh, kind of star-shaped pieces attached to each of these points for overshoot protection. Uh, you can see, like here there's a cam, here there's a cam, uh, and the cams are different timings on all the different lead uh, cylinders. The idea being that once this is done with its adding, that cam will engage with a cutout in the star to block this from rotating any further, so that you know if you give this a, a quick crank and these gain some momentum, they might want to keep going even after they disengaged, uh, because the, you know once. Once this is out of the tooth section, you know, I can spin this as much as I want. There's nothing stopping me. So if these had gained some momentum, you know, they could, you know, go further than you'd intended and add uh, extra digits or extra numbers uh, than what you had entered. Like if I entered a five and this gained some momentum, it would actually result in adding a six because there's nothing to stop this from doing that. But what does, what, so what they did to stop that was they added those uh, star pieces in there they call them a Maltese cross. And as soon as the tooth section of the Leibniz wheel has moved past the, uh, where it's no longer driving the shaft, that cam would have engaged with a cutout in the star so that this is blocked from turning any further. Um, and then once it stops, then this will keep going and the cam will disengage, but since it's already stopped, then it's fine. It's gonna stay where it is. Um, and well, on this machine, uh, this does not have that. This was modified by Tate um, to remove those and instead add these uh, springs here, which add some drag. So there's a little bit of drag on each of these uh, digit shafts, and that's the uh, overshoot protection. I'm not exactly sure why that's a better system, why Tate thought that was a better system than the interlocks with the star wheels, but um, that's what he did. So that's what we have. But anyway, um, normally they would have the overshoot protection here, but this particular machine doesn't modify to have it here with these pieces. Um, the only thing to point out really is this is your direction change. And all that this does is this will move the this carriage piece here, not really a carriage, but um, you can see that these are double bevel gears. So when it's in this position, the bottom half of the gear is pushed up to engage with the accumulator digit. However, when you push it down, now this piece disengages and this piece engages. And that just has the effect of, even though you turn the crank handle the same way and the machine runs the same way, the accumulator is driven opposite directions. It's like when this shaft rotates this way, you can see that the accumulator digit would rotate this way. But if I engage it this way, now when this shaft rotates this way, the human digit rotates the other way. Uh, so that's all that is. Um, and this has a little cutout here so that you can only change direction when the, the machine is uh, not in the middle of a cycle. So that's what the cutout is. As soon as you start a cycle, you can see, you start this way. Now you can't change direction. And only this would not be allowed to go backwards. Um, on the bottom of the top plate here, there's a ratchet, so the crank can only go one way. Um, I'm just tuning it backwards manually here for demonstration purposes. Uh, so that's pretty much it. The only thing to mention is on the uh, back here, the carry trips. So you can see that these are held in place by little spring detents, which are these fingers right here. You can see that normally they pinch on the inside of those two holes, and then when you push it, they pop over and pinch on the outside, and that's just a little uh, detent to keep those either engaged or disengaged. Um, and that's pretty much it for how this works, really. Now you can see how this, uh, Direction change works, it's just a pivot lever which then uh, has a, a rod that goes over here to pivot a shaft that runs all the way across the bottom. 
and then that shaft has pins on it, which you can see one of them here. So when that shaft on the bottom rotates, this pin will uh, push either direction. That's how that works. It's a pretty pretty basic machine, really. Uh, I think that pretty much accounts for, you know, all the operations going on here. Um, as far as the carriage, take a look at the carriage here. So this is the top of the carriage. And you really need to see the entire thing is pretty much the same, its whole length. You can just see that down here in this section, we've got the uh, counter, and then this is the accumulator up here. And then it just continues on, uh, same idea. Uh, this crank is for clearing the counter, I think, and the other crank is for clearing the accumulator. Uh, the interesting part is on the bottom. Let's flip this over. So you can see here are the bevel gears that will engage with um, these bevel gears. So you can either engage with with it on the top side or the bottom side. And this I still have to fix this yet. One of the springs is uh, broken there. You can see it All right there. That should be a detent spring. So these will be detented, but this one I still have to fix yet. Um, so anyway, these are the uh, accumulator engagement gears that engage with those bevel gears there. These little pins here, these diamond shaped things are the carry chips. Those are what will push on these fingers to trip the carry. Um, the accumulator or the counter uh, increment, which is this piece right here and this piece, no, just this piece right here. This piece right here will engage with the little uh, louvers there. You can kind of see. That's what will uh, increment the uh, counter. And then for clearing, you can see it just has these uh, tooth uh, shafts here, not really shafts, but tooth pieces here that when you turn the crank handle, if I don't drop it on the floor, they will drop down, you see how it's dropped down kind of, to engage with uh, teeth underneath these bevel teeth. If I turn it back, see how it pops out, disengages, and those gear sections down there have one tooth missing at the zero position. So when this engages, it will drive it until it gets to where the tooth is missing, which is when this wheel is at zero. And then because the tooth is missing, it can't drive it anymore. So these all stop at zero. And basically the same thing for the counter, which you can actually see here, the tooth is missing right there. So when this shaft drops down to engage, it will not move this wheel because it's already at zero. Uh, that's basically how that works. So um, that pretty much covers really everything about uh, how this machine works. Uh, I don't think I missed anything. Um, really, it's uh, pretty basic overall. Um, you can see these cutouts here. Those are what this piece will engage with. You can see it's got a pin on the back. So that um, just sets the carriage in, you know, locked into a particular position. Uh, that's all that, that is. So, and that's really all I've got, all I've got to say about this. Um, I said overall, it's a really pretty basic machine, um, and it's nice too because when you take it apart, you can pretty much see everything. You know, it's not like there's pieces hiding down somewhere. Really, pretty much everything is, you know, visible just by looking at it. So, I hope you this video, and thank you for watching. All right, so uh, I went through, cleaned up all of these. Uh, so the bottom of these uh, detents here. Um, I adjusted the springs to the ones that were looser. Remember, this was the one that uh, would just fall whatever direction you tilted the plate, but now, that's a nice little detent. I think it'll be easier when you're pushing the knob on top. So I'm just pushing the end of the shaft so it kind of levers either direction, makes it kind of weird. You push down close to the end, it's uh, much nicer. Um, so really simple, all I did was just, uh, Pull these pins out. They're worn in real tight because the spring, uh, you know, provides the friction to hold them in. So just kind of pop them out. I uh, just bent these a little tiny bit to give them more tension, and then I put the pins back in, and that seemed to have uh, resolved it. So uh, I'm gonna flip the turbo, put it back on, and we'll make sure that uh, 
all these are going to be able to set numbers with no issue. I'm not sure what we'll be able to see, but the way I put this back on is I got the uh, bubble gear and everything lined up first. Um, got that meshed in the position where I wanted it so that this handle is right on top of the pin indicating stop. Um, and then I slid all of these up and then used my uh, pick here through these slits to slide the gears up. And then uh, I'm not sure if you ever see this on camera, but you can actually see right down in here, at least I can. Get, there we go. Now you can see right down in here, that is the finger on the bottom of the slider, and you can see how it's in the groove there. So, um, I left all the screws out of the place, so this was free, and then I just went through and looking through this gap here, um, slid the gears up to get all of them in uh, line and with the pins dropped in the slots there, and then put the screws in the top plate. Uh, so now let's uh, move this around and see how everything works. Alright, so these should be able to set. Yeah, I think that's fine. This one's a little bit loose, but yeah, I might have to readjust that one. That's a bit looser than I'd like. That one seems to be tent well. Should probably apply a little bit of oil to the, the top here, just a little tiny bit, um, since it's pushing against that as well, so that might See this one, I got too much oil on, so there's oil on top, and that one's a lot smoother, so that'll probably help additionally. That one's pretty nice. Of course, this one probably has the least wear in it. Um, you're doing most of your calculations with, you know, maybe two, three, four digit numbers. So column six, it's a lot smoother. Probably just because it has less wear on everything. Overall, not bad. Like I said, I'm going to put some oil on this one, I think. Might help that. Same with this one. Uh, but this one I'm going to have to take back off and readjust because that's it's a little bit looser than I would, would like that to be. Probably would like work because, you know, it'll stay where you put it, but still would kind of like that to be um, a little bit tighter. Move these all to zero. Should get nothing, which looks like I should get nothing. So I put this to one. Yep, not sure if you saw it, but this did move one position. That'll work out just fine. But like I said, I'm going to take this off and readjust this one. But you know, overall, um, that'll work out okay. Just have to readjust that. Over here, I will check all nines and make sure there's not too much drag. Something funny going on there, though. This seems okay now, though. I'm not sure. Uh, so it happens. I have to take a look into what that is. But right after I guess off the last movement wheel, it feels like. Put this to zero. Doesn't happen. So yeah, something something's fine. I have to look into that. Yeah. Um. Pretty satisfied with that so far. All right. So as you can see, I've got the uh, carriage back on here. Um. So I wonder what I or all I did here because I did quite a bit of work um, off camera. But as you can see, I've got one set in there now, 
we got this up to addition. If we turn the handle, I'm sure if you can, you can't really see, but um, one has appeared here and here in the counter. So we got one there, the glare, and one in the counter. If I change this to subtraction, takes away the one there, takes away the one there, and if I go again, so that it does subtract, then it carries all the way across. Um, notice that the alignment here is not 100% perfect. It's definitely readable. Um, I think that is possibly due to the um, the the way they have the Maltese cross removed and the uh, spring drag for overshoot. Um, with the, I believe with the Maltese cross in here, when that our cam comes on and locks in, it should lock it positively directly in line. Uh, but because that's been removed, it I guess sometimes locks a little bit off like that. Um, that's just going to be the way it has to be. Um, you know, the, uh, the detents in the accumulator, the spring detents, are really not to, you know, force the wheels into a particular place. They're mainly there to keep them in place when you lift the um, register and move it. Or you have the carriage and move it. So they're not strong enough to overcome the um, that drag spring on the double bevel here. So um, that's not a problem. I think the problem is that because they moved that Maltese cross, it doesn't always positively lock in the set position. So I really don't I don't really understand why they removed that. Um, like I said, you know, multiple other orthomino designs going forward, you know, even a hundred years after this was made, we're still using that. Maltese cross type thing, so I really don't understand what the idea behind removing it was, but anyway, um, you can see that carry all the way across works, um, and then of course it increments for subtraction as well. I'll change this back. There we go. They will also uh, carry all the way across for addition as well, so that seems to work. So, um, a couple of things. One thing was the first time I tested this, the carry all the way across did not work. It stopped in the third column, and it turned out that one of the or multiple Leibniz wheels were actually out of time. Uh, not quite sure how that happened, but uh, what was happening was because the second and third Leibniz wheel were actually timed together instead of this one being one step behind, uh, what was happening was the carry from column two to column three was happening at the same time as the carry finger was already passing the carry gear for column four. So when the column three carry trip tripped, it tripped after that little drive finger had already passed and so would not have gotten uh, picked up uh, in column four. So, and I noticed that if I uh, put like a one here or in some of the other columns, the same type of deal happened where we only carry so many and then stop. So. All I did was I loosened up this shaft on the front so I could disengage it from the uh, Leibniz wheel shafts and then just rotated them until they looked like they were pretty much going to be in the right time and then tested it and it worked. So uh, that's how I rectified that. Um, as far as the carriage itself, let me lift this up here. Um, did some cleaning here. Uh, the clearing mechanism I think I described before is taken care of by this. A uh, long bar here for the uh, accumulator. You see the teeth here. When you turn the handle, this bar will go forward to engage with gears on each of the accumulator digits, and then it rotates them until they all get to zero. Um, there's a missing tooth on each of the gears. Not this bottom gear, the bevel gear on the bottom. That's what engages with those old bevel gears there. There's actually a gear up behind that that has a missing tooth, uh, and that's what this long uh, piece here engages with. Uh, so this will slide across, engaging with that gear, rotating it until it gets to the point where the tooth is missing, which of course that will stop then and stay at zero. Um, and then the same idea for the uh, counter, you can see right there the gear is missing a tooth right there so that when this shaft slides across, it's the little ramp type thing there where it's going to drop down and then slide across. Um, leave that at zero. 
Uh, so I took off this whole piece here. You see that it has little spring fingers that push on this piece. So I took that off, took that off, cleaned all that up, uh, took out all these guides and did the same kind of cleaning for the counter. Uh, so that's nice and smooth now. Um, those are actually supposed to be spring loaded. So you can see right here, this little drum here, there's actually a watch spring in there, which is supposed to be attached to the central shaft so that um, when you turn the handle, it's supposed to spring back, but um, both of those watch springs are broken, both for the uh, counter and the accumulator, and the accumulator one is in this barrel here. Um, I'm not gonna do anything about that. Um, Honestly, I don't think it's a big deal to have to just, you know, hand rotate these back to zero. And given that this machine is so old, um, not sure how comfortable I'd be with these, you know, snapping back to zero anyway, or not to zero, but snapping back home anyway. So I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, just a minor thing. And actually, I'm not even sure how to get this one apart. This one you can see is open on the bottom, so the shaft may slide up through, I'm not really sure, but this one, um, should you see that or not, but over here, it's open on the bottom, so I'm not sure if this, this shaft will slide up and out, or how it comes apart, but this one, I thought that maybe I could pull this gear off the bottom, but actually you can't. So probably the only way to get that one apart is to take the crank panel off the top, which would involve removing this pin, which I doubt would have come out, and I really don't want to mess that up, so. Um, you know, even if you have to like drill this out or something, it, the damage to the surrounding parts is highly likely this is a pretty tiny pin. So I think I'd better just leave well enough alone and manually turn them back to the back to the home position. Not gonna be a big deal. Um so also just can't really see it here, but um the spring detents for the digit wheels here. You can see how they have this like clover pattern on the outside. Um there is a spring finger for each one so that starts up here and then goes down into one of those little divots there to detent those so you can see they snap into position like that um one of those was broken when i got the machine that was down here somewhere so i had to make a new one for that um just use some thin sheet steel cut out of that bend it to shape uh drill some holes in it and screw it in uh seems to be working okay Took a couple tries to get it to fit right. Um, I don't know if you remember, we had another one over here that was, you know, bent out of shape, so it wasn't even contacting the the wheel at all. Um, and then when I tried to bend that back into contact, it just broke off. So I had to make another one for that too. Um, there's one more that's slightly concerning, which is this one. You can see this is pretty loose and it doesn't super positively lock. Uh, so that may or may not be an issue going forwards. I'll uh, we'll have to see, but uh, anyway, I think that's about it. Um, oh, also, I think last time we videoed this, uh, if you entered all nines and turned the crank, there was a bit of a clunk in the sticky part. Uh, turned out that that was um, due to the messed up teeth on the input uh, bevel gear set uh, down here. Um, so two things I did to rectify that one was the, so what was happening was if you rotate the handle without anything set on the keyboard, it was fine. The only issue was when you entered a nine in this column, that would cause a problem. And the reason is because the, with the additional drag of the, um, overshoot spring, uh, in this column that was adding, you know, some additional load to the input. So with that additional load. Uh, that was bringing out the issue with the messed up teeth. So uh, what I did was I rotated this entire bevel gear shaft so that the messed up tooth was a different position relative to the input so that that drag would appear at a different time and hopefully not be an issue. Um, and what I also found was that this input shaft is pretty loose. You see how that wobbles there. Um, and so what was happening was when I got to the messed up tooth section, the input shaft was actually kind of lifting up to sort of demesh with the cross shaft here. 
Uh, so what I did was there was a little brass washer uh, in between this bearing block here and the bevel gear. So what I did was I just put a little bit of a bend in that to kind of make it like a spring washer so that it's pushing this bevel gear down into mesh with that one so that, um, so if I put it, it's nice and smooth now. So I think that's really about it. Um, did a little bit of light cleaning on the carriage. There was some dirty areas in between all these setting knobs here. So clean that up. Uh, also, some of the setting knobs themselves were loose. Uh, these knobs are just a uh, press fit on the shafts there. So I just, the ones that were loose, I just took them off and then just squeezed the ends of them with the pliers a little bit to kind of squash them. And then they were a nice tight fit. So I just pushing them back on and uh, that seems to be fine now. So I think that's about everything I did here. I'm not sure if you can see, but this one, you see this one here, it didn't clear out. That's the one with the uh, iffy detent. So I said I might have to, there it went, now it cleared out. So maybe you're gonna have to make another spring detent for that, I'm not really sure. Uh, something interesting, at least that I found interesting about this machine, is that there are no uh, coil springs that I've found in here at all. Um, anything that needs any kind of spring tension is, I don't know if you really call it like a leaf spring, but basically like a leaf spring. It's just a, you know, a thin piece of spring seal, something like this, that pushes against whatever it needs to uh, spring into. So uh, that's what they have for the real detents here. Just this uh, piece of spring that you know, it was screwed on here and it has an uh, arch down into the detents on there. And as I showed before, same thing for the carry trips. Um, they have two uh, spring fingers like that, which will either spread out and latch on that side or spread out and latch on the inside. So yeah, everything is like, the only thing term I can think of is this uh, leaf spring, but I don't know if that's the right term. Um, uh, no coil springs, so, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, anyway, I think I'm ready now to put this back in the cabinet, or case, whatever you want to call it. Um, I glued that back together. It is still missing the, there's two pieces that go down either side of the carriage, so it is still missing one on this side. I have to figure out how I'm going to make that, but um, otherwise, yeah, I think mechanically this is pretty much done. Um, other than maybe the issue with this uh, loose spring there, but to carry all the way across works, so um, really pretty basic machine overall. It's not, not too complicated. Um, you know, as smooth as it's gonna get with the slightly messed up gears here, but really you don't even really notice that when you're operating it, it's, it's pretty pretty smooth. So yeah, pretty satisfied with the, how this came out so far. Um, put it back in the cabinet. So the box may not look cosmetically any better, well, at least it's all in one piece now. Um, I still have to do a little bit of gluing on this veneer, but I can do that with the machine installed. So if we open this up, um, remember before this whole side was all loose, so that's glued back on. Um, some of the pieces of the top here were coming loose as well, so I glued uh, this bottom piece glued back on, and this side was coming loose, so I glued that back on. Glued this uh, piece here back on that fills this gap when you close it. Uh, I'm still missing the one that goes here, so I'll have to see if I can make that. Um, this whole box was all in pieces. This was out. Um, this little support here, which kind of holds that in place, was also out. So glued all that back in. Uh, box is whole again because he has his back wall here. Um, this doesn't close all the way, which it looks like it's a problem from new because someone had shaved some of this piece down. Um, but I guess they didn't shave it quite far enough, but it doesn't hit, hit on the litter or anything, so I'm not really gonna worry about it too much. Um, so you can see where there's a piece of felt down here too, um, which actually is not in bad shape for being almost 150 years old. Um, it's just, uh, I'm not sure exactly. I don't know if it's supposed to be like sound dampening or what, but kind of interesting. So anyway, um, 
I do not have the key for this, and I'm really not going to worry about trying to make one. Um, you know, just in case, you know, of course, the locking mechanism is also 100, almost 150 years old, so, you know, don't really want to, even though it looks okay, you don't really want to mess around with if you lock it and then it breaks and you can't unlock it, so um, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Um, anyway, so let's see if we can reinstall this. It's not the most convenient thing to do because once it's in here, you can't really get at the sides at all. I'm kind of pinching my fingers here. This side is in. is not so let me let's see why that's not wanting to put it on in here. Because really it should just drop in. Let me take a look at that, see why that's not dropping in. Alright, so it's in now. It turned out that this um, piece of wood here had gotten uh, when I glued that in, it wasn't exactly perfectly aligned. Um, so that's why, because this was over slightly, there wasn't no space for this machine to fit in. So just had to take that back out and then um, realign everything all up, glue it back in. Uh, so the glue is drying now, but um, you know, it was screwed in on the bottom and now it was screwed in on the top as well. So that should you know, align but ideally. Um, the door still works. So. Um, there's a little bit of a gap here. Um, I think that's partially because when I glued this back on, it wouldn't go quite up perfectly against. Um, you know, this uh, it's like a, I'm not sure we call it dovetail joint, but the joint here is was all messed up. So, um, you know, this thing is old, so you can't expect perfection here. Um, and especially the damage that we had, this whole side was just broken right out. So, you know, as long as the machine goes back in and works fine and the uh, roof closes, which a little bit of adjustment there. Um, see these two pins go in these two holes, so you have to bend those a little bit to get it to line up exactly perfectly, but I think it'll be good enough. Um, so anyway, if we back in here, So now I've got one set. I have to do some cleaning on this here. This is a little bit stiff to uh, flip that up there. So I guess I've got one set on the keyboard, change to subtraction. And for some reason did not carry all the way. Yeah, I did. That's the last column. So yeah, never mind. We're good. Carry over there though, that's interesting. Hmm. Oop, a minute ago. Putting it in the cabinet shouldn't affect anything. Let's try it again. Change to subtraction. Carry all the way across. Change to addition. Carry all the way across. Okay, not sure what that one's about. So that all works. So let's try one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, eight, seven. This one's a little bit stiff. I think that might have been one of the springs that I adjusted. So I made it a little bit stiff, but it's uh, definitely movable. Three, two, one. I'm not sure if you can read it, but 
3330 is correct. All right, you can see we've got six operations counted, so that seems to be fine. Uh, so, just let this up. Fill that up. All right. Um, of course, this particular column here with the VHD tent doesn't always exactly clear out, so I might address that in the future. But um, yeah, for now, um, I'm going to make a separate video doing the uh, full demonstration um, for people who just want to see it demonstrated and not you know, don't care about the repair. Um, so issues that remain are um, getting these pins lined up with these holes in the front, um, potentially that one loose spring detent all the way over here. Um, this handle is a bit stiff to fold up and down. So I'll we'll probably have to look into that. Um, and just the overall, the case is old and wood and not perfect. So, but function, functionally though, um, everything you know seems fine. We've got our carries, so um, it seems to add properly. Uh, also, we're missing the decimal pointers, but um, I'm not sure if I can make some of those or not. Oh, uh, while we're here, we did forget to look at were those typewritten papers in the, that were, came in the cabinet here. Let's uh, take a look at those very carefully. Um, not sure if these came with the machine when it was purchased. Um, I think the date on this machine, based on the serial number here, number 1449 is around 1876. I want to say 1874, really, but I think it's actually 1876, which I believe was one year after the typewriter was invented. So, uh, not sure how popular they were. Um, it just seems like a general uh, directions for use. So the knobs or handles at the easing spring should pop out to fly back, but should be gradually eased to their former position. So, um, or even when this machine was in use, they tell you not to let these fly back. So, um, just more of an excuse for me not to fix the springs in there. Uh, I'm not sure what country that address is from. Uh, this machine came from Australia. Um, but it, so this machine was made in France, and then judging by the... Uh, Information on the top here that uh, was modified by Tate would have had to gone to England. You can see, it looks like Farringdon Street, London is the address given there. Um, and then I purchased it from Australia, so I'm not sure you know, this address is a seller in England or a seller in Australia. Um, pretty sure this is not from France because I don't think they would be, I think it would be English if it was. It's one of the papers there. And the other one here, so we can run this up without it deteriorating. So yeah, a little picture of the machine there. Just uh, pointing out different parts of it. Read that there. Straightened out here. Yeah, that's not really going to work. Right. So, capacity and other stuff. So, yeah, anyway, kind of interesting. Not sure how long this machine would have been in service. Um, these were made up until I believe 1915, but by 1915, you know, the calculator market had changed dramatically. You know, this, this particular model would have been introduced in 1865, um, and really there was not really anything to compete with it at all um, until, I think, Burkhardt started making his arthrometers in uh, 1878. So, you know, from 18, 
or well, the original one from 1850, and then this redesign, which added the um, the full counter there, and I think might have done some rearrangement of the location of this little box. Uh, it was in here in 1865, and so from 1850 until really 1878, if you wanted a machine that would do, you know, the full operations, uh, this was it. You know, the Comptomino came out in even later in 1887, and um, that really was only good for addition and subtraction when it came out. Um, division and multiplication wouldn't really be feasible on the original machine, but anyway, and there was no other, you know, design of machine, you know, because Brokaw basically just copied this um, until the pinwheel machines came out in the 1890s, so that's the machine when it originally came out in the 1850s, and you know, this was made in the 1870s, this was basically it. If you wanted to calculate it, this is what you got. The only thing available. But by 1915, when the production of these ended, there were so many other options, and only a few years after that, uh, the electric machines came to market. So, um, were you the person that bought this from? Said it was made in 1912, but I think they were going off the uh, PN serial numbers. Um, after Thomas de Calmar died, I believe his son took over the business, and then after his son, the lead mechanic, um, I forgot his first name, but his last name was Payen, took over the business, and then he changed the logo to have his name on it, and at some point reset the serial numbers. So um, if you go by the Payen serial numbers, I think 1449 would, would put it around somewhere around 1912, but um, as you can see, based on this, this still says uh, Thomas DiCarlo, so this is the uh, earlier version. And Payne made some enhancements too. Um, like this has the uh, rotating, originally one had knobs, but this one has cranks for clearing. Uh, Payne added the uh, slide clearing to his machines, which actually I believe was not his invention. Um, I think Tate actually had that when he came out with his own hour thermometer, I believe the early 1880s. Um, there's another thing I wanted to point out too, so this here, so I'm not sure if I got a good shot of this yet. Um, you can read what it says, it's kind of hard to read some places, um, but it says the thermometer Tate's patent improvements. And so it looks like originally uh, Tate must have had some kind of business modifying decomer hour thermometers. Uh, to his patent, and but later he went on to design his own hour thermometer, um, which which included some and more of those improvements. Uh, like if, on this machine, we had the um, the Maltese cross interlocks replaced with the drag springs. Uh, if you look at Tate's hour thermometer, that also has that same setup. Instead of the Maltese crosses, it has the uh, drag springs. But he also made some other changes as well in his machines. Um, I believe he replaced the double leaf spring carry uh, trip detents um, with coil springs or something like that, or some other type of spring mechanism, uh, along with a few other things. So um, it's kind of interesting. I don't know uh, how much is known about these modified hour thermometers, um, but if you search Tate's hour thermometer, the only thing that comes up is his business and when that was founded. So, uh, you know, not sure when he started doing this or how many of these machines he did before starting his own or before releasing his own uh, in-house manufacturer thermometer. But anyway, um, basically it just tells you how to adjust the um, the springs to get the right tension. Um, let see what it says. Tension is sufficient to really remain stationary until the movable end of this it gauge rises, so the height marked when pushed. So maybe you're supposed to have some kind of special tool to adjust that, I'm not really sure. Um, something interesting here, the motor panel must be turned at a steady rate not exceeding 100 revolutions per minute. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, until you just how to clean it and oil it. You know, there's the adjuster C, Lightning Company, so it's found in Street, London. And Leiden went on to manufacture 
uh, Tate's own design out thermometers. Um, Tate's out thermometer is actually manufactured by uh, the Sky C Leighton company. So, uh, anyway, I think that's about it for now. Um, like I said, a few small things here and there that may address in the future. And like I said, I will be making a another video on the full demonstration, all four operations of this machine. But that's about it for now. So enjoy this video, and uh, thank you for watching. Let's hold it down, so I have to fix the pins there, that's all.